This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. You're gonna acknowledge me. What's going on, everybody, guys and girls? Welcome back to another edition of the SmackDown Review right here on the WWE Podcast. As always, I am the host of the show, Michael Ritter. You can find me on X at Michael Five Ritter, on Instagram at Michael Ritter Five, and also One of the hosts of the Football Function Podcast, available on all your podcasting platforms, including whichever platform you're listening to the show on right now, also available on Patreon. If you prefer an ad-free listening experience, and per usual, this show as well is available on Patreon, ad-free listening experience. There are multiple tiers that get you a lot of different benefits, but just the dollar a month gets you in the door and access to a Discord chat and many, many other you know, benefits such as an ad-free listening experience, which is always good because I know that there's always reviews and negative comments about the amount of ads that, you know, pop up in, you know, these podcasts and many other podcasts like it. Sorry to break it to you, but that is just the nature of the business. That is how this works. If you are putting the work in, and doing everything behind the scenes to set up a podcast, you know, for you, the consumer, you just have to click play, you know, you just have to go to whatever app you're on, hit play, bam, it's there ready. But for Matt, and you know, people who do this behind the scenes, engineering production, it takes a little bit. And yeah, you want to be rewarded for that. You know, you want to be rewarded for your work, and you want to actually expand monetize your work. So that's just kind of how ads work and the reason why sponsors and things like that get worked in the show and if you don't like it a dollar a month is very doable I feel like you know and that's just my personal opinion I know sometimes that might be a big difference but I guess uh what I'm trying to say is it's an easy fix you know it's not worth getting on one of the apps and leaving a negative review about the ads like I know that there might be more than your typical podcast, but hey, you know, this is Matt's show. He's allowed to run it however he wants to, and I guess that's just how it works. But nonetheless, talking about the reviews and the ratings and things like that, that's the main reason why I wanted to kind of chime in because I did see a review that Matt actually posted that I believe might have been about one of my previous shows. Remember, I had a guest on either last week or the week before. And there might have been some noise in the background that, you know, some people might not have appreciated, but that's just kind of, you know, how it works. Obviously, you're not going to hear any background noise right now in today's episode because I'm by myself. I'm here in my studio, which the last episode in the studio, and I'll get into that here in just a little bit. But the, the episodes, whenever there is a guest, whenever somebody is on the show, we can't control what their audio sounds like. Now, we can to an extent if there's something going on pre-show, like, hey, you need to turn this up, there's this noise going on in the background, then yeah, we can comment on that. But once we start recording, once we hit that record button and the episode is going, if we hear something in their background, it would be extremely counterproductive to just continuously say, hey, fix that, do that, whatever, like... That's just kind of how it is. So you have to understand that like whenever we have a guest, sometimes their audio might not be as up to standard as, you know, the typical host. And that again is just kind of the nature of the beast. They're a guest for a reason. You know, we appreciate them taking the time to join us. I do apologize if there were any, you know, noises that you guys didn't really appreciate or enjoy in the episode. You won't have to deal with that for today's episode, so hopefully that will make up for it. However, I will say, like I just mentioned, this is the very last episode that I'm ever recording in this house that I live in. And I've lived in this house since June of 2020. Today's June 1st, 2024. A little bit of a a poetic ending, just given that it's in the same month, four years later. But it's no secret if you've heard me talk about it before, I didn't start doing this podcast until October of 2020. So obviously this is where I lived 
for every single episode that I've ever recorded on this show is in this house. Now I started out in one room, went up to another room, and now I'm out in a different stu- like a different part of my house. And so the the studios have kind of come and gone. But in terms of the actual place where I record, it's always been in this house. So there is a little bit of a bittersweet feeling to this episode because of that, you know. And it's you know it's not going to change anything. Like I'm going to continue podcasting just no matter what, but, you know, obviously just it's a little bittersweet that this current place that I'm at is where I can legitimately say some dreams came true, and I really do appreciate all of you for listening. This is my 198th show here, and all 198 took place on the grounds that I'm standing on right now pretty much, so... Just wanted to give that a little bit of a shout out. The next time you hear from me, I will be at a different location and we'll see kind of how that goes. But nonetheless, I'm excited to talk about this episode of SmackDown with you guys. I'm moving all day, so there is a little bit of like a time restraint. I kind of had to squeeze in watching SmackDown this morning and haul butt out here because typically I, I like to let there be a little bit of a time gap between when I finish SmackDown to when I actually record this to, you know, think about things a little bit more, maybe do a little bit more research of something I didn't really understood or understand happened during the show. So there is a little bit of a off schedule feel to this show, but we're going to get through it. Nonetheless, um, I'm going to cover the episode of SmackDown that took place May 31st, 2024 from Albany, New York. I was pretty satisfied with this episode of SmackDown. I have to admit, I, I think that not even on some type of grading scale, just actually watching the show and letting your eyes be the judge, just passing the eye test. Don't think too much into it. Don't try to see if there was any hidden messages, what was the storyline development, this and that. Sometimes, yes, that's very important, but if you can just sit down and enjoy an episode of SmackDown and whenever it's over, you say to yourself, hmm, that was a pretty good show, then I think WWE did their job. And I, I think that WWE really did do their job on this specific episode It started off with the general manager, Nick Altus, opening the show and welcoming us all to SmackDown and then introducing the Queen of the Ring, Nia Jax. And Nia reminds us that winning the Queen of the Ring gets her a title shot. And then she tells Bayley that she's coming for her at SummerSlam. As Bayley's music hits, she's walking out to the ring to confront Nia Jax, but is attacked from behind by Piper Niven and Chelsea Green. Chelsea tells Nia that she doesn't have to worry about Bailey because by the time SummerSlam gets here in August, Piper will be the new WWE Women's Champion. Nia clarifies that it doesn't matter who's champion, she is going to annihilate her regardless, and you could tell that Nia Jax is being positioned as someone who is unfazed by a, a challenger coming out, taking out the person she was initially cutting a promo on. That doesn't really bother her. She's essentially just saying like, okay, cool. Thanks for, you know, weakening her up a little bit. But it doesn't matter if she's the champion. If you're the champion, I'm going to absolutely walk over whoever is holding that belt. And as someone who's never really been a big fan of Nia Jax, I have to admit that it's pretty easy to say that this is the best version of her so far. Like, I don't think that's a far-fetched statement. I think that just all the different iterations that we've seen of Nia Jax have been pretty underwhelming. And this one, for whatever reason... It just seems a little bit more satisfying, like they might be hitting the nail on the head a little bit more. We'll see if it continues, if it gets a little bit stale, a little bit redundant. How does she continue to do this? Does she maybe show some new leaves every single week? There's multiple things to look for as we continue to get closer to SummerSlam and see how Nia Jax handles being the queen of the ring. Up next, AJ Styles and Nick Altus speak in his office again. Remember last week they had a little bit of a a conversation. I will say this time we did see that little Uncle Howdy teaser that kind of popped up. I'm not doing any of the, you know, looking at the barcodes. I apologize. It's just I've been there, done that many, many times before, and they're all just riddles. They're all just, oh, you got to think, and you got to really think about this and that and try to put puzzle pieces together. I don't watch wrestling to solve riddles. I watch wrestling for that exact reason, to watch wrestling and watch these storylines get developed. So I'll let somebody else put the pieces together. They could look up whatever's going on with Uncle Howdy, and you know I'll take their word for it, or just look at it from like a, a wider approach once some of the pieces have already kind of been connected. But anyways, back to this conversation here. AJ Styles says that he would appreciate an opportunity to address his future tonight. Nick asks if there's something he needs to know, or something that, he, that AJ needs to say. 
But AJ says it's going to be hard enough to do it once. He really doesn't want to do it twice. Like if there's no reason to say it twice, please don't make me. Um, this did very much feel like a retirement teaser. He came out dressed way nicer than what he normally is. That was clearly a conscious decision. They wanted us to wanted it to seem like it was a big night. And typically, whenever wrestlers do that, they will come out dressed in nicer street clothes. Like anytime we see AJ Styles, especially lately, he's been in like those black pants with his black vest. But he's always usually in some type of wrestling gear. And if he's not in wrestling gear, don't we see him like in jeans with like a cut off shirt and the split right there, like on his collar, where he could easily rip the shirt off. So it's always been a different look for AJ Styles. He's never come out looking like this. So that's why I felt like, okay, this is definitely something special here. And we should probably treat it as such. And then they kind of just continue teasing it throughout the night. And obviously, once it gets here, we'll talk about that. But like we just talked about with the opening segment, how Bailey got attacked. Now we see Naomi checking on Bailey while she's being attended to by the trainer. Basically, just to confirm that she's still good to fight tonight. The trainer says yes. Naomi leaves, apparently headed to talk to Nick Alta, so we'll talk about that here in just a second. Up next, we get Tommaso Ciampa versus Austin Theory in a one-on-one match. And this one was kind of interesting here because usually this match would be meaningless, right? You see Ciampa, you see Theory, it's a one-on-one match between two members of a tag team, and you think that nothing was going to come from it, especially what actually did end up coming from this because Grayson Waller was a major factor while he was standing outside of the ring. Um, It was a relatively quick match, but from minor interferences to having a big mouth talking to the commentary team, essentially taking credit for Theory's quote-unquote relevance, saying it's because of the Grayson Waller rub, he pretty much causes Theory to get get distracted, I apologize, and then ultimately lose this match. Theory really doesn't know what he said. It was um, Johnny Gargano that pretty much pointed and tattled on him if you will he's the one that told us in theory that Grayson Waller said something but the thing that I noticed here is like they're in a loud arena do you realize how loud it is inside of a a live WWE show the chances of him actually hearing Grayson Waller say something like that I mean I just felt like the plan mm, I guess I can accept it the execution was absolutely sloppy and You know, I understand what they were trying to do, but I really don't understand why. This is a heel team that seems like they have a lot of juice left to be squeezed. Why are we trying to put a wedge between them? It just doesn't really make sense in my personal opinion. Um, But, you know, it is what it is. All of these champions can't have long title reigns. You know, we're going to have to see some belts change hands probably in the near future. And it just seems like by default, it it could end up being Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. We do get Naomi finding her way to Nick Altus' office. She does end up exchanging words with Blair Davenport while she's discussing a possible tag team match tonight, obviously talking about Piper Niven, Chelsea Green versus her and Bailey. That match does get confirmed, made official for tonight's show. But I thought the Blair Davenport interaction with Naomi is a little bit of an intentional thing that they did there because clearly... Blair was having a conversation with Nick. Naomi just barges in, similar to how her husband has done, Jimmy Uso, how he's just barged in Nick Aldis' office and demanded to talk to him while he's talking to somebody else, such as Meechin that one time. That was pretty hilarious, actually. But Naomi did the same thing here. Blair didn't appreciate it, and you could expect that probably in the very near future we're going to get a one-on-one match between those two. I would like to get exposed to Blair, especially if she's going to be a woman here on the smackdown roster then i feel like it only makes sense for me to get to know her uh let's see carmelo hayes and la Knight. this was a a viral moment that kind of sparked from an interaction they had la Knight went into nick's office pretty much just asking about aj styles they have a little bit of a conversation we don't get to see what was said but as he's leaving apparently all that he told him was logan paul isn't going to be there tonight and then we see carmelo hayes walk up And obviously he references when he got drafted and he tries to cut a groundbreaking promo. Only problem is he calls LA Knight or he calls Logan Paul LA Knight while he's talking to LA Knight. So clearly stumbled over his words there. Um, A little bit of secondhand embarrassment just because LA Knight absolutely dunked on him, called him out for stumbling there. And it just shows that I just feel like Carmelo Hayes 
is a little bit overhyped, and I'm going to continue to say it as long as I am reminded on a weekly basis that he's coming out here trying to force these really well-spoken promos where he calls himself him. If you just listen to him, it's just, I don't know. It's not my cup of tea. But like I said, I think L.A. Knight is someone that if they are going to go on a little bit of a war of words, then L.A. could end up getting the better of Carmelo Hayes just by default because it does seem like the moment might be a little bit too big for Carmelo at this point. And I know that could be a little bit of a stretch, but we've seen a lot of people come up from NXT and not thrive on the main roster despite having a lot of success on NXT. And it could very well be the exact same thing here with Carmelo Hayes. I'm not rooting for his downfall, but I'm just simply saying that I don't necessarily see what everybody else sees, especially whoever decided to make him the first round draft pick for SmackDown. That that would have never happened in a million years had I been making that selection. But up next, we get a one-on-one match, Apollo Crews versus Andrade. We see a little bit of a little video clip of Angel Garza making a pitch to Andrade earlier in the day to get him to join Legado del Fantasma. Andrade respectfully declines, says thanks, but no thanks. Garza ends up coming out during this match and giving a little bit of an assist to Andrade to help him get the win. And then the rest of Legado del Fantasma come out after the match and Andrade literally walks through them and really doesn't acknowledge them at all. They clearly don't appreciate that. Neither does Angel Garza because he goes backstage a little bit later and tries to confront Andrade about it. But obviously Apollo Crews upset for getting cheated out of his match or distracted, whatever you want to call it. He didn't lose fairly in his eyes. So he goes right to Angel Garza and he attacks him in the locker room. And that's probably going to start a little bit of a feud going forward. But I just don't understand why Legado del Fantasma's programs that they get in always have to be centered around like somebody with a Latino background. You know, like they're either going at the LWO or now they're trying to recruit Andrade. I'm not at all trying to bring race into this, and this isn't like a a rant at all. I'm just saying that it's something that I've noticed with the LDF, like Auto Del Fantasma, that they really don't go after anybody else. So that's kind of just something that I've, I guess, noticed. And I would like them to do something a little bit different. I just don't want them to try to fit them into a little bit of a box, you know, just box them into that. Like, okay, you guys can only go go after like these type of people. Like, no, they can clearly feud with anybody else, and I would just like to see them expand a little bit on who they're going after and why they're going after them. Let's see here. What is next? Um, We get a, a shot of the Bloodline backstage. They're getting prepared for their tag match tonight against the Street Profits, and Heyman goes on a little bit of a rant explaining the measures that were taken back with Roman Reigns. He called it, quote, unquote, counsel before any violence took place and he thought that there was a pretty good strategy to everything that Roman Reigns did and he questions if Solo even has a strategy and then Solo mentions that he has you know I don't know if control was the word that he used but he made it seem like he's keeping tabs on Cody Rhodes without Cody Rhodes even knowing it so take that for what it's worth I don't necessarily think that it's anything Cody should be worried about This version of the bloodline, if I'm being honest, is a joke. And I'm not trying to seem like this is like a negative show. Because clearly, I told you as the show started, I like this episode of SmackDown. There's just specific parts that I'm not necessarily a fan of. The hyping up of Carmelo Hayes. So clearly, I'm going to voice my displeasure about that. And also, this version of the bloodline, I just don't like it. I think they should be called the midline. Because that's pretty much what they all are. Very mid. And that could even be a little bit of a compliment or an insult to the word mid whenever you're talking about some of them. Like Tonga Loa, I don't even like... He 100% should have gone to NXT or stayed down at the developmental or something like that. Gotten a little bit more polished. The dude botched his debut spot whenever he came out from under the ring at whatever pay-per-view that was. I can't even remember because it was that forgettable. Like I feel like this version of the bloodline shouldn't be taken serious whatsoever and i'm not the only person that feels that way because we get a little bit of a promo from kevin owens he comes out to the ring and he explains why he returned last week pretty much he wanted to have randy orton's back randy orton has had his back several times over the past few years so he wanted to return the favor a little bit and i think that's a 
a nice reason to come back. Kevin Owens is looking great. He's looking like he's in great shape. He's wearing a new RKO shirt that has, you know, obviously the KO there. It could have been out for a few weeks now, but it's the first time that I've noticed it. But after he finishes talking about Randy Orton, and he starts to talk about the bloodline, Paul Heyman comes out, and his body language tells you how much he hates this version of the bloodline. We get very loud, we want Roman chants. Paul Heyman reiterates that nobody wants Roman Reigns here more than he does, and that leads Paul Heyman to tell Kevin Owens just how much Roman Reigns actually respects him. Blah, blah, blah. Then he tries to warn him to back off the bloodline because he should be afraid of the quote-unquote criminals that are representing it at this moment. Kevin Owens pretty much laughs it off. He doesn't fall for Heyman's quote-unquote act. He accuses him of pulling all the strings. And then he speaks for the crowd, and specifically me, whenever he absolutely disregards this version of the bloodline. He doesn't even mention their names. He mentions the old bloodline going toe-to-toe with the Usos, Roman Reigns, He says, this is just Solo and his guys. And that's pretty much exactly what it is. And afterwards, a brawl does ensue because, you know, the rest of the bloodline comes out and then the Street Profits come out. And then we get a little bit of a six-man all-out brawl, which leads to a tag team match that we already knew was going to happen. The Tongans versus the Street Profits. And that was what Corey Graves called them. You know, Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa. It just makes sense to give them a little bit of a nickname, and I'm sure that that's probably been their name for a long time. I'm just not familiar with them outside of WWE, but I will call them that because it's a little bit easier, and I don't really like calling them the Bloodline because it's just like a a generic version, like a Wish version of the Bloodline. But the Tongans do steal this win after a discreet tag was made, and the Street Profits thought that Tonga Loa was the legal man, but he wasn't, which allowed... Tama Tonga to go in there and steal the win. I understood why they won this match. You don't want the bloodline looking any weaker than they already do. So yeah, you got to give them a nice little cheap win here. So I totally understand that. We see Indy Hartwell calling out Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill backstage for injuring Candice. Bianca claims that Candice tried to injure her first. Jade gets in Indy's face, runs her away. And you know no one is even willing to step up to Jade at this point. I do want to see someone have a little bit of guts and, you know, stand up to her. It seems like something that Becky Lynch would do. You know, Becky Lynch would never be afraid of somebody like that, and she would get right there up in her face. Maybe we need somebody else to do that, and who knows, it could end up being Charlotte Flair whenever she returns at some point. But speaking of stepping up, Meechan steps up to Nia Jax backstage because, obviously, Meechan was getting interviewed by Caleb Braxton talking about AJ Styles' possible retirement. Nia Jax just tries to steal the interview and say, why are we even talking about AJ Styles? All everybody should be talking about is the queen of the ring, Nia Jax. Meechan doesn't like it, steps right into her face, and Nia Jax tells her that she is going to regret that. And who knows if that is actually going to be the case. But up next, we get that tag team match, Bailey and Naomi versus Piper Niven and Chelsea Green. Chelsea pins Naomi after Piper pretty much does all of the dirty work. This was a very good showing from Piper, I will say. She basically beat the women's champ in a two-on-one match. Like, she handled I mean, we all know Chelsea Green isn't the best in-ring worker. So Piper had to do a lot of the carrying here, and she beat the current women's champion and a former women's champion essentially by herself. So I did have to give Piper Niven a little bit of a shout-out there for obviously stepping up. And having one of her one of her better showings, and even whenever she was getting propelled earlier in the show, whenever they came out, and Chelsea said, "Hey, Piper's going to be the champion come SummerSlam," and I got that little face off between Piper and Nia, I was like, "Okay, I could probably get behind this." Just being completely honest, so I think that if we do inevitably see Piper versus Nia, it could be a spot for Piper to take the throne. You know, Piper could be the new powerhouse in the women's division. But the thing that was teased all night was AJ Styles addressing his future. And the video package, or I guess the graphic that they showed that was highlighting this all throughout the night, it showed a picture of AJ Styles, you know, back in the the 90s, his 2000s days in TNA, and then ultimately the version of himself now here in WWE. And on his way out to the ring, he passes LA Knight, he passes Cody Rhodes, 
And then he runs into Anderson and Gallows, who ultimately bring he brings them to the ring with him. And when he gets out there, he he says that he understands why Nick said that he has to go to the back of the line. It's Nick's job, and that's all he was doing. But at this point in his career, he just simply can't do that. He mentions being in attendance for his son's graduation last week. Shout out to AJ Styles' son. And then he gives thanks to Gallows and Anderson. And he said that whenever he was coming out to the ring, he whispered something in Cody Rhodes' ear, and he asked him to come out to the ring and join him for this, which is exactly what he does. Cody Rhodes comes out and... Pretty much AJ just thanks him for their match at Backlash. He says, if that was my final match, then I have to say it was an honor going out like that. It was an honor having the match in front of that crowd. And he just thanks him. And then he reminds him that SmackDown is the house that AJ Styles built. And the reason why he called him out there was so that he can hand him the keys. Cody thanks him himself, calls him a quote unquote big bro. And, you know, he thanks him for being that big bro to the SmackDown locker room. The two share a little bit of an embrace from the crowd before AJ suddenly attacks Cody Rhodes and starts beating the hell out of him while Gallows and Anderson block any officials or security from coming to break it up. And then AJ ends it by hitting a Styles Clash off of the stairs, and that is how the show goes off the air. This was a pretty good way to end SmackDown. They did have you, it was a little bit of like a bait and hook, like they wanted you to believe that AJ Styles was about to call it a career. He was about to hang it up. He's been teasing it for like several months now. And I do still think that that time is coming. That time is near, but it's not right now. This did have, have a little bit of like a shade of Mark Henry. I got a lot left in the tank. And ultimately, I think AJ Styles does still have a lot left in the tank. And I think that even if he doesn't win a championship in his last run here in WWE, it could be you know, still really impactful if he has storylines like this, if he's going up against champions like Cody Rhodes, maybe gets his hands on Gunther at some point. Who knows where AJ Styles can go in the immediate future. But I'm glad that he's sticking around. Glad that he's here on SmackDown, obviously. And, you know, this is going to be a fun little feud. Cody Rhodes versus AJ Styles likely leading all the way up to SummerSlam. And that would be a hell of a, of a match to add to that card, just given the match that they had at Backlash. Would be a little bit predictable, but hey, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Cody Rhodes is going to have to go through some guys in order to make this championship reign feel like it means something. And there is none better, arguably, than going through AJ Styles. So I am all for what he is going to do, um, you know, in, in the summer of 2024 leading up to SummerSlam. But that does do it for me, guys, on this episode of the SmackDown Review. This is my final episode here in this current studio, in this house. And it is a little bit bittersweet, but all good things must come to an end. And literally, as soon as I close this laptop, after I send this episode off to Matt, I am going to unplug my equipment. I'm going to unplug this mixer right here, all my microphones, my computer, my laptop, everything that I have in here is about to be, you know, boxed up and moved somewhere else. So this is the final, uh, final bow here at this place. And I appreciate you guys for coming along with me on the ride and, um, I know good things are going to come, but thank you guys so much for joining me on this episode of the SmackDown Review. Hopefully you will be back next week whenever, you know, we already got some matches that are going to be teased. That will be going on next week, so you definitely won't want to miss that. Have a damn good weekend. Enjoy whatever it is that you're going to be doing. Just do it safely. Come back next week. Join, you know, all the other shows that are going to be happening, the Mailbag, the Raw Review, all that good stuff. You definitely want to stay here your one-stop shop for everything pro wrestling, the WWE podcast. Thank you guys so much. Have a damn good weekend. Walk passionately in the direction of your dreams, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the WWE podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.